joining online. I don't know. Uh, I'm the person talking right now. Brian Miller and I am the uh, director of the Owen McKiernan Library here at the Celtic Country Arts Center. And we are delighted to be presenting Neve Nakara today. The talk uh, that Neve is going to be giving is called Transformative Figures and the Challenge of Archiving Their Work. And Neve, uh, of course, Anybody that tuned in last night um, to the fundraiser and anybody that knows me as a performer um, knows she's a fantastic uh, musician, but she's also an archivist and we share that um, mix in our careers. Uh, I'm also a, a musician that became fascinated with archives. I got involved here at the library. We um, are going to hear Neve speak about her work as an archivist at I so, see, you know, I, the name has changed now in this university, so I have to be careful. The University of Galway. The uh, archives that we worked with uh, in Galway there uh, have to do with the, what English speakers might call the Gaelic League, Connor Nagroga, and then also Mary Robinson, a very important um, figure in Irish politics and many different things that we will explain to us today. But uh, these are very important archives for the history of Ireland and modern Ireland as well. And uh, we're delighted that Neve has been willing to talk to us about her work and what it means to be an archivist, what it means to work with these important collections. Uh, and so I'm going to hand things over now to Neve. Perfect. So Cormac is going to press play on the slides, and I'm going to be guiding him as to get this all to work. So basically, uh, let's get stuck in. Brian Murray. Very kindly introduced you there, and as those who tuned in yesterday would, would realize my background has been in music for a very, very long time, but I ended up getting sucked in um, willingly to the world of archives, uh, partly through my work on the Cost album. Mm -hmm. um, but since then, I've become a professionally trained and qualified archivist, and I work, um, as Brian said, in the, work in the University of Galway, formerly NUI Galway. Uh, previously University College Galway and originally Queen's University Galway, so it has undergone a few name changes and this one is the newest as of last month. Um, and I do want to point out just at this uh, uh, point in time, um, the University of Galway logo is at the bottom of your screen there, our brand new one. Um, I am here in my personal capacity but with the blessing of the university, so I am not here on university business because I am here playing tunes for the next week, so we're wearing it. So um, that's the first thing I just wanted to say. And as Brian mentioned as well, then um, I work on what are really two archives. So the first collection um, that I started working on was the Conor McGregor Archive or AP. Um, and I finished that February of this year, so that's now fully cataloged and available to researchers. And a new project has just started to digitize a portion of it and just to give you an idea of funding, I think they, they were very happy to get um, a quite a considerable amount of money. And then I, I calmly told them that actually if they wanted the entire catalog digitized, it would cost about a million. Um, because digitizing is expensive. It's very easy to say, oh, just digitize it, it'll be fine. But actually it's very resource heavy and time, you know, time money, storage, uh, all of that is, is an issue. And I, I, I think Brian will know this more than anybody else in the room here. Um, that finished uh, in February of this year, but I was job sharing with myself for the last few years. I've also started working at the Mary Robinson Archive. And of course, Mary Robinson is definitely what would be described as a transformative figure. Um, she was our very first female president and she completely redefined the role of the president of Ireland, but she didn't come into that from nowhere. She had quite um, an influential um, amount or body of work before that, and she continued working after that. In fact, she's still working. She's making my life very difficult because uh, there seems to be no end to this archive. Uh, but there you go. So I'm gonna get Carmen to go to the next screen. Perfect. So, and um, don't worry, there isn't going to be a test at the end of this, I promise. <laughs> But just, I suppose, to get across this idea that it is a, um, a professional qualification. Um, and 
why why the work of an archivist is so important. Um, and I wanted to clarify that, I suppose, as well, because it's one of these words that is used quite liberally in, in, in the English language uh, without these people realizing that there are that there is a profession involved and there is training involved. Um, it's, I don't know if you have that Holiday Inn ad over here that uh, they think they're professional pilots because they stayed in Holiday Inn the night before. It's quite, it can be a little bit similar. Um, but those in the, I would say, in the information um, uh, area, so librarians and archivists and, and, and digital humanities, there is quite a lot of overlap there and um, a lot of qualifications that, that kind of are, are, are um, sympathetic to each other, if you know what I mean. Uh, an archivist is the individual responsible for appraising, acquiring, arranging, describing, preserving, and providing access to records of enduring value according to the principles of provenance, original order, and collective control to protect the materials, authenticity, and context. context. And I will go into a few of those um, in, a little bit, in a little more detail. So what I'm going to do um, is, I'm going to get you to go to the next screen. Yeah. Um, what I want to do is just describe a small bit the work uh, behind the scenes, the work that an does. And then I'm going to give you some sort of um, little gems from both collections to show what value there is in these two uh, collections as an example. So the start of any project, um, this is a fairly common image, boxes and boxes of material. Um, most likely in no particular order. And there's a good chance the material has been stored in somebody's shed and been forgotten about, perhaps in an attic, perhaps, um, um, you know, perhaps somewhere for decades and has been completely forgotten. A little bit, a little bit like Donnelly's arm last night, I was discovered in the basement. Um, and the Conan O'Grady archive, when it came in, it was the largest the university had ever acquired until Mary Robinson's <laughs> archive arrived in. And they were both over 700 boxes. Um, in fact, the Conan O'Grady collection um, was the equivalent of about 850 boxes because they were so overstuffed, uh, random box sizes and everything. And just to give you an idea, I think that top right photograph, uh, their boxes from the Barry Robinson collection, that's about 10%, a little bit less than 10% of the boxes. And of course, you know, that in itself is, it has challenges. The scale is a huge challenge because, you know, unless you're absolutely um, blessed to have mass storage space, you're never going to be able to store these boxes in such a way where you can look at or access every single box whenever you want to. So you kind of have to start at the nearest and start emptying it out and, and, and sorting it that way. And that poses challenges as well. So, um, there are a lot of um, a lot of stages to process in a collection before it can be made available, and essentially they can be listed as follows: know what you have, make it safe, appraise it, decide on an arrangement, catalogue it, consider what should be made accessible. For example, is it too fray? Um, does it need to be protected because it's too fray, or are there GDPR issues or sensitivity issues, anything like that? And then release it, um, and it can be very daunting to know where to start when faced with the scale of a project that was in front of me. So the main, the first really important thing is to have a, a project plan, a clear work plan. So I, facing this, I decided to break down those requirements into three main steps. And this, this really was because of the scale of it. Uh, the first one was to appraise the collection or the first pass. The second was to come up with an arrangement if it was necessary, and I'll explain that in a little bit more detail in a bit, and then to catalogue. And you'll see a plus sign there because there's other decisions you're making at the same time as your catalog. Um, you will see throughout this presentation some images from both of the archives, but I just wanted to explain that some are professionally digitized because they have been digitized out of necessity already. And some are just ones that I took with my phone as I was going through the first pass, partly to remind myself of what was in there. Um, and to help with arrangement at a later stage. So because the Mary Robinson archive isn't open yet, you're actually getting a sneak peek into this archive. Um, so special. Um, this image, for example, is a booklet that was given uh, to Mary when she visited an adult education centre during her presidency. And putting aside the typos in Irish, for those that are uh, keen, keen, keen going, of course, uh, 
too smart to be Latna Hibra, um, which translates as uh, a good start is what well, is the equivalent of a good start is half the battle. And I thought it was um, fitting considering the work plan being so important to put in place before you go any further. And it says, Lanarai, Kamunchna Hair, Nikas, Lat, carry on, uh, people of Ireland are dancing with you. And it relates to a quote that she said, um, Come dance with me in Ireland. So, next one, please. Now, I probably should have given a trigger warning for this one. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, a praise in the collection. So, this is the process by which the contents of every box are taken out, examined, listed, and placed in special archive boxes that um, essentially slow down the process of deterioration. And then they're stored in safe air conditioned storage rooms. And it includes the first three steps that I had listed earlier. And these three steps are no <coughs> to have, make it safe, and evaluate it. So, when I'm examining the contents of every box, I'm also checking the condition of the contents. For example, is there mold that would spread to other collections? We definitely don't want that. Or are there other little delights like that one <laughs> on, the, on the left of the screen as I'm looking at it? And that is actually um, unidentified, but it definitely had wings and had <laughs> not frozen before um, uh, or died from some, from some way before uh, it, it hatched. We would have a lot less usable material to put it that way because in some cases the, the paper is their food so you see little bike marks and everything like that um, and not everything in a collection needs to be kept either so you see the middle uh, image for example with lots of uh, copies of a particular flyer from Colin the Vega so we would have, we would tend, tend to keep between three and six copies that would be the standard and then everything else would be we would have a donor agreement with whoever had given me the collection in the first place what do they want to do with doubles that you are not going to be using? As in Conor Vegas uh, case, for example, they wanted them sent back, then they were going to share them with individual branches so that they would test the material. And this is all down again to resources and storage being a huge part of, of um, the drain on an archive, um, having storage space. And if you use your storage space to, to keep, you know, 100 copies of one thing, what other material are you not getting because you don't have room for it? Um, sometimes it just may not be physically possible to store it and it's a large artifact and you don't have the right conditions for it. Um, but at this point, at the end of the first pass, um, everything is safe from the elements. We know what's in it to a very basic level and we know roughly where things are. But none of the items in these boxes are in any order. And any items related to a particular subject could be scattered throughout the collection. So if you imagine somebody asking you for something to do with a particular branch, you go, oh God, that's, you know, that's actually spread across 72 boxes, but not one to 72. It could be any 72 boxes out of 600. So everything's made safe, but it's not usable. It's not really, it, nothing's particularly treatable. So we move on. I'm keeping Cormac on his toes, mm -hmm. once intended. And step two. <laughs> Step two is the arrangement, and um, this is very important to, to come up um, with a clear logical arrangement, uh, which gives us intellectual control over it. It gives it structure, it lays the groundwork for making items more discoverable to researchers down the road by grouping related material together under distinct categories, such as series, subseries, files, etc. And there are two parts to this stage. You have to excuse my very cheesy icons here. <laughs> And um, first of all, I have to come up with the logical um, arrangement. And the next thing then is to physically pull all the material out of the boxes and rearrange them under that arrangement. And um, normally with a collection, the archivist would try and retain any existing arrangement. But with both of these collections, there are several reasons why this, this isn't always possible. Uh, they were enormous consisting of many different subjects spanning a significant period of time. So items have been stored in boxes in different locations at different stages and have been moved several times in some cases. So in the case of Conrad Vega, it spans 130 years of material. And during this time, Conrad headquarters moved six times. There were 32 presidents, 35 terms. Uh, and that's not mentioning the work of the general secretaries as well, probably as many of those. And that's a lot of different work methods as well. So everybody would come up with a different way of doing it and everything gets rearranged again. In Mary Robinson's archive, it's just one person 
except it's kind of not really because her archive spans six years. She also moved several times to take on several roles and therefore interacted with different groups of people uh, from Mayo to Dublin to Geneva to New York and back again. So fun times. And um, once I have come up with an arrangement on paper, I then need to physically put, or put the items together under that structure. Over to you. Come again? Yep. And the next part is cataloging the collection. So this, uh, this is exactly what it says in the tin. Um, it's predominantly um, involving really painstaking, slow work, cataloging, um, box by box, file by file, like my item where possible. And then there's two further considerations that we, that we do at this stage. And the first, as I kind of hinted at earlier, is, is um, accessibility based on GDPR, for example, and fragility. Um, and also um, considerations that adhere to various legislation. So for example, child protection legislation, you have to make sure that you're covering that kind of stuff. Um, and this of uh, particular importance with the Mary Robinson material because this is contemporary material. Um, a lot of the legal cases that she took on before she became president when she was working as a barrister, these were hugely uh, significant from a society point of view. A lot of the people are still alive. So what do you show? What, what can you show? Um, the work that she did during her presidency, but also onwards um, with the UN um, as part of the elders, a lot of that material would be of international, political and diplomatic importance, but it's also of international, political and diplomatic uh, you know, importance in terms of considerations as well. So not everything um, is possible to be shared. For example, various governments will have laws as well in terms of uh, security. And the second consideration, depending if you know that there might be a budget coming down the line for digitalization, this is when you start with your notes and flagging things going, if we had money, which would be great to digitize this, and if we had money, we should stay away from digitizing that because it would cause problems. Um, a major part of the cataloging of the collection is to make sure that you're Given the context of an item. Um, if you just look at an item, I think a very good example is the song, one of the songs that um, Christy Moore did, I think, and it was it was all about uh, a meal that was being cooked, and it was the list of ingredients, and that's just that's a record, but the meal was being cooked very lavishly at a time of famine was happening. That's the context. And it's really important when you're looking at an item, it's just a good example when you're looking at an item that that context is part of the story, and that's what makes carpet. Archivist's job is really important because, and I talk about this um, towards the end, it's what helps combat things like fake news. Um, because I can be doctored, but the job of an archivist is to prove the originality, the authenticity of, an, of, a, of a document, whether it's paper or um, digital. And so that's part of our work. And I just want to show the images on the screen here on the right, sorry, left. <laughs> is the Oireachtas. This is the very first program, the very first Oireachtas in 1897, and they are actually 125 years old this year, and the very first part of the digitization of the Conan archive will be digitizing all of the Oireachtas programs that we have, and that should be coming online hopefully before the end of the year, which will be a huge resource, because a lot of times people go into the Conan Gregor archive and they want to research their own family members that might have entered a competition. Mm -hmm. And so that, that will be all digitized and hopefully people will be able to find them. Now, whether the OCR works with uh, old Irish script, we don't know. We might have to manually go through all the names, but at least it's a start. And then that's just um, a, a report from the elders, which I've been to. Then. So uh, I'm just going to give you a little sneak peek into what is in the Conrad Baker archive. This was an organization that was founded in 1893 to promote the Irish language in Ireland and abroad. And the collection encompasses material from this period through to 2018, which is when it was accessioned and when it was deposited in the University of Galway. And following on from several 19th century organizations promoting the Gaelic revival, Cun McGregor became the main organization to spearhead the Irish language revival. Its existence has subsequently coincided and overlapped with the revolutionary years leading up to and including the Irish War of Independence, Civil War, the foundation of the Irish Free State, the early years of the Republic, the turbulent period known as the Troubles, which saw human rights issues and political strife come to the fore in Northern Ireland, 
through to the emergence of the Celtic Tiger and beyond. As such, the material gives us a unique insight into the almost 130 years or more of the history of the island of Ireland, with many of its members prominent and active in a much wider context. So it's a hugely rich collection um, that can be tapped into for people to, to research. Um, but ironically, because it's in the Irish language, it tends to get forgotten about, which is a real pity because it's, it's really, really rich. As such, the material, as I said, gives us a unique insight. Um, it's worth noting that Conor Vega was intended to be apolitical. Its first president was Douglas Hyde, or Dugoff Nita. The first Ulster branch of Gaelic Lee was formed in 1895 in East Belfast, under the active patronage of Reverend, of Reverend Crozier, with his parishioner, Dr. St. Clair Boyd, as president, both unionists. For other Protestant pioneers of the Irish language in the North, the League was a non-sectarian door into the nationalist community, with whom their political sympathies lay. In 2008, Conan Abelga adopted a new constitution, reverting to its pre-1915 non-political stance, restating its aim as that of an Irish-speaking Ireland and dropping any reference to Irish freedom. So it's just purely about the Irish language and culture. Over the course of its existence, the staff were and continue to be actively involved in promoting and observing the use of Irish across all aspects of everyday activities. And as such, the collection includes material relating to all aspects of Irish society, which is what makes it so, so rich. So things like running of classes and events, Irish language publications, correspondence with businesses, government departments, members of the general public corresponding with Conor Rebellion, giving out that Irish wasn't available to them if they were trying to contact, if they were trying to deal with the business or trying to contact the government. Um, it also contains a lot of research into other minoritized languages and communities. And I use the term minoritized as opposed to minority, really, really important. Um, a significant portion of the material covers several language rights campaigns. In the latter half of the 20th century, Conor Vega, along with other organizations, was instrumental in community campaigns which led to the creation of Irish language radio and television stations, to the enactment of the Official Languages Act in, um, in July 2003 in the Republic of Ireland, and to making Irish an official language of the European Union, which happened in 2007. Campaign material in the collection also includes documents related to prisoners' rights and civil rights in Northern Ireland, in particular during the period of the hunger strikes. So this, um, this is actually kind of a behind the scenes, under the bonnet look. Uh, this is an archives database, or CAM it's called, which is very badly named because it does not, <laughs> uh, uh, it never it never leaves an archivist CAM trying to deal with it. But this is the back end of the Conor McGregor archive um, in the database. And you'll see uh, at the very top, G60, that's the code for Conor McGregor. And then you have the hierarchy, you've got um, 45 that you can see there, uh, series of categories, and if you click on any of them that has a plus sign, there'll be further subdivisions and subdivisions. And what you can see is it's a hugely extensive archive, but this gives it that structure I was talking about earlier, that arrangement that makes things so much easier to, to manage, to have intellectual control over, and uh, it makes everything so much more uh, discoverable. Um, in the first in the first section of the Belga archive, um, series 1 to 13 covers the organisation itself, so things like its structure, annual reports, policy documents, finance, publications, the Ordesh or annual Congress minutes, um, PR, and material for various branches and committees. Second section relates to arts and culture in general and includes things like festivals, both Conor Rebecca festivals and non Conor Rebecca festivals, both in Ireland and abroad, and also uh, just music in general, sport, drama, literature. And then the final section is broadly uh, covering research. So research relating to particular individuals, quite a few can quite transformative, including, for example, Paul Pierce, um, but also uh, research into Northern Ireland, politics, government departments, and businesses. And it also, as I mentioned earlier, um, contains an extensive series relating to various campaigns involved in the organization. So just to give you an idea, a flavor of some of the campaigns covered, and then I'll focus on a few of them. This is just a basic list of some of those campaigns. Um, there is a series called campaigns that have quite a few of these under it. 
There's also some campaigns that are so big they needed their own series. Um, so those would include education, Northern Ireland and media. Uh, they, there's such a huge volume of material in them. Each one of those series will be a collection by itself um, under normal circumstances. So it could be, could be 50 or 60 boxes. At the core of all of these campaigns is the right of the individual to their own name and to living inter and interacting in their own language. One that is indigenous to the island of Ireland and which was initially protected, but not very well in our constitution. Many of these campaigns include refusal to pay bills and licenses, including, for example, dog licenses, <laughs> because either the address was wrong, the person's name was, was wrong, or changed after the initial form was filled out, but changed without consent, or the response was in English after the initial letter had been sent in in Irish. Here we have two items relating to health. On the right is a brochure on preparing your child for hospital, which, as you can imagine, is a very stressful time at the best of times. But when you have the added worry of bringing your child to hospital that um, will, where the medium is in a language that's not the first language, it just adds to the stress. So this is like a, a brochure helping um, Irish language speaking families introduce the idea and concept of hospital to the children. On the left, we have um, a report from a case where five people were involved in a car crash and were taken to Nefer County Hospital, this is in the 1980s. And when they gave their names, the names were refused because they were in Irish. And this is hugely significant because this is in the northwest of Ireland. It is in one of the areas that is technically a great, an Irish language uh, region where Irish language is the first language. And still their, their names were not being accepted. And so Conor Vega issued a press release at the time listing examples of names in German and French and making the point that the hospital would not have dreamt of asking for English versions of those. The health board subsequently had to apologize to the five involved. So on the next slide, <laughs> Cormac has jumped up again. You're not seeing this, this is great. <laughs> um, Conor were constantly submitting suggestions to the government on how to provide services through Irish or how to make Irish more visible. So this is one example, for example, with photographs of the old signage showing English only. And then the submission on the far left from Conra, which showed a suggestion for bilingual signposting, which if you've traveled in Ireland, you realize is actually very close to what is there now. On the right is a book called, it's a log book for Amrano Kjartha, which was the uh, rights department. So Conra Bega were in fact in constant communication with various departments of the government, reminding them of their obligations and objecting to their failures. And uh, a section, Called the Rights Bureau was actually set up in Conan Vega headquarters in Dublin, whose sole purpose was to log these complaints received from the public so that Conan Vega could, could then use that data uh, when they were making their cases to the government. And next one, please. As mentioned previously, staff actively researched other minoritized languages and language communities to see how they were being treated by their governments and how they were reacting. Material was constantly being gathered, which could be used to provide examples of what was possible. Here we have some examples of bilingual and multilingual packaging and forms. So the item in the center, which is an, in an old, it's an old Irish landing card. If you landed at Dublin airport, you would have been given this. Now it's multilingual, there are four languages present. Ironically, no Irish. So it proved Connor's point that it was possible to be, to have a multilingual uh, 40 cards, but it also proved Connor's points that the government were failing their Irish language obligations. On the right, top right, is one of my favourite items because you would never expect to find a peanut wrapper in uh, an Irish language archive, but it's there because <laughs> <laughs> the things you find is there because it is an Aer Lingus peanut wrapper from the 1970s, judging by the, the design. It's in four languages, including Irish. <laughs> um, and this was showing, yes, it is possible, and it has been done, and more businesses should be doing it. But ironically, this has taken on a second kind of value, because from a social history point of view, it proves that peanuts were sold or were available at one stage on airlines, and they're no longer available on airlines. So it has a very different kind of uh, value now. And underneath it then, same kind of thing, um, that's a wrapper for uh, Welsh uh, potatoes, uh, crisps. Is that no, chips, chips, chips. Um, 
But this, again, it, it's in Welsh, but this uh, company has since gone out of existence. So there were a lot of Welsh people that were following the work from the grade and, and my cataloging. And when this image went up and I shared it on Twitter, they were getting very nostalgic. Uh, but you have this kind of social history element running through all the time. And just to mention as well, this is a marriage language archive. Uh, there's 24 languages um, to be found in the collection because of all the research that we did in the videos. So onto a slightly heavier material, but really, really fascinating. Um, material in the collection includes the, the, that relating to prisoners' rights, both north and south of the border. In many cases, it relates to the Irish language, but in some cases, it relates to conditions and treatment of prisoners, for example, strip, search, strip searches. And um, it follows several particular cases. Um, on the far right, we have a press release calling for the abolition of the death penalty and demands that uh, neither the Murray couple or any other per Irish person be condemned to death. That's 1976. The first two images here are of letters from prisons in the north to Cumra. They're very different in tone and show the changing um, climate, I suppose. The first one is apologising for the lack of Irish language learning material available to the prisoners in the prison library and requests recommendations. That's 1975. Scroll on a few years, <coughs> things have slightly changed in the north. And this one, the second one reads, your visit was stopped in accordance with Northern Ireland Prison Service. Conversation between prisoner and visitors will be carried out in English unless the prisoner and visitors are not capable of conversing in English. And that was from the Mays prison in 1981. So right around the time of the hunger strikes. The final image, um, I'm not sure if you can see it particularly clearly, but it is a tiny item um, written on cigarette papers that came out of the Mays prison. Now, you would think it, it has very um, uh, salacious detail in it. They're just writing, looking for more Irish language material. That's all they're asking for in that message. But they're writing in Irish, and therefore um, it wasn't allowed. So they had to smuggle out the letter because it was in Irish, not because of its content. Um, and that's 1984. Mm -hmm. But it's when you see it physically, and you see the size of the shelves, but like it's a few cigarette uh, papers lit together, very carefully and then very carefully written on, I think, again, from the social history point of view, it's, it's hugely important. Media is another one. And we have some fantastic um, postcards here that were part of a postcard campaign. Um, from the start, when we had only one channel in Ireland, Conor Rebega um, have been leading the charge in pushing for Irish language programmes. I would say more Irish language programmes, but at the time there were barely any at all. Um, here are four samples of those postcard campaigns um, where the public were encouraged to sign and send a card scene to either RTE, which is our public broadcaster, or to the government, depending, basically shower them with these. Um, Bruntonus Nanulloch, RTE, this is the one on the uh, far left bottom, and it's basically saying we don't like this Christmas cake. Um, only 2.8% of the programming is in Irish at the time. Um, what's more, if you look at the one on the right, it's asking for Irish language programs for children. And it's basically saying, you know, speak Irish to me, um, give back the old language of the people to the children of the people. And one of the reasons for this is that the only Irish language material that was available on television was news. There was news and current events, there was nothing else. There was no programs about sport or music or children's programs, nothing at all. There you go. Yeah. Part of the move to get this Latin program corrected was the TV license campaign, where activists refused to pay their license, and quite a few of them ended up going to jail for it. And as far as they were concerned, they were being insulted doubly. They were being insulted by asking, by being asked, by being told they have to pay for a license, and then having nothing in the Irish language available to them. Um, and some of the people that were jailed were actually school principals. So the sign on the left, you probably can't read it, but I'll read it out here. Rapists, joyriders go free, while Gregory are jailed. And the other one is, we package shamrock and we sell, so it's yeah, Irish speakers. So this, this hypocrisy, basically, the government always saying this Irish culture and everything, and yet at the same time, 
not supporting those who spoke in language. That's it. That yeah, my, my father was arrested for protesting. Was he? Yeah. He's probably in the air, right? <laughs> Somewhere. Somewhere. Uh, and it's interesting because normally um, on that subject, the GDPR would be a huge issue. But quite a few of the people um, were still in the process of asking people. But quite a few of them, if they're if they're asked, they go, "Oh, I have no problem with everybody knowing I was arrested." You know, the private as well. But you have to do to Dylan. And, and you GDPR. just to what's that acronym? GDPR. Um, GDPR is the that was passed about four years ago. That was it's the general date. data. Protection regulations. Yes, uh, for the European Union, and then Canada and the US have their own standards. Yeah, yeah. Canada's are very similar to Europe. The US is. Yeah, the US wouldn't be up there in terms of, of protection. Yeah. Um, it's like a right to privacy kind of thing. Yeah. Or is it different? Yeah, than that? so people's uh, contact details, um, right. everything like that. Yeah, there would be huge we have very, regulations. Very few laws over here. Yeah, it's huge. Uh, it's a big difference. It's changed the world. Data privacy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 and I think quite recently it, it's affected websites. So if you were accessing a website in America that was a European website, you had to accept a few things and vice versa. Mm -hmm. um, because of course the websites came under different territories legally. It came in on January 1st, 2022. So every every kind of thing that you have to access is, is hugely different. Yeah. And Facebook had to change all their yeah. protocols mm -hmm. and practices. There's a lot yeah. of huge, huge And it's interesting because Twitter is for example, as one of them is based in Dublin and has that comes yeah, under yeah. EU law as a result, it comes under Irish law. So it's a, it's a hugely interesting area, but it's also yeah. pain, pain to thorn, as they say now. <laughs> well, translate that one to your own. <laughs> and, but just, just looking at Conor McVeigh, because I'm, 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 I'm slowing this down quite a bit. Um, Conor McVeigh really, really achieved quite a bit, and they're still working. Um, that middle picture is a screenshot of the rights um, under the Official Languages Act that they were hugely um, a part of, 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 of achieving. Um, the Official Languages Act, which, greater, which essentially gives greater statutory protection to Irish speakers. Uh, Irish is now, as I said before, an, an official language in the EU. The media landscape has completely changed with the addition of um, Telefish de Grega, uh, which became TG Cagher. Uh, Radio the uh, Irish language radio, um, community radio stations in Irish, um, including in Belfast, which is hugely significant. Um, and there was an announcement uh, a few weeks ago that there's going to be a new Irish language kids channel that comes in under the umbrella of TG Cap, which would be fantastic. Another part of the, the changing landscape is Grey Scullin. So Grey Scullin are schools, um, primary, secondary, what's the equivalent here? Um, well, it would be grade school and high school. Grade school and high school through the medium of Irish. And originally in the 90s, it was parents themselves because they weren't, the government weren't providing these. So it was parents themselves that set up these schools that volunteered um, and that's the collective money to pay the teachers and that, you know, brought in the toilet roll and everything to the classes. And the government actually were quite obstructive um, and wouldn't recognise them for quite some time. The movement uh, you know, finally got recognition, and um, people all over the country are now going to grade school. And in fact, you have a, a new generation of people who's who went through grade school themselves and are now marrying and having children. And um, the result is that, in particular, in urban areas, you see a, quite a surge of Irish language, um, Irish language speaking communities, which is fantastic. And in recent years, Conor McGregor have remained central to campaigns to protect language rights throughout Ireland. It, um, the strategy encompasses the promotion of increased investment in Great Precarious, for example, advocacy for increased provision of state services to Irish, and the development, as I mentioned, of Irish language hubs in urban areas. And it also, very importantly, continues to promote the language in Northern Ireland across all communities and uh, to push for the enactment of the Irish Language Act. Uh, to protect the language in Northern Ireland. So that's that. Now, this talk was about transformative figures. With Conor McGregor, there are so many transformative figures that are part of this, but I just wanted to select a few here. You will, of course, recognize um, Douglas Hyde on the left. Uh, this was a visit he made in 1905 to do a bit of fundraising. Uh, Douglas Hyde, of course, as I mentioned earlier, went on to become president um, of 
of Ireland in, in 1938 until 1945. Uh, and this was hugely significant because he was Church of Ireland and they were trying to show this is, we need a neutral person, we need to make sure, uh, having gone through the, the, the trauma of the Civil War coming out the other side, we needed to be handled delicately. Um, and that's Douglas Hyde and, you know, hugely, hugely important. The one on the, on the, on the right for me, or on the left, sorry, um, depending on where you're looking again, I'm getting myself confused. This is a guy I find very fascinating. So his name is Kamal Sultan He was born in Inchman. He was educated uh, on the island and then in Galway. Uh, so Inchman, sorry, is the middle of the Iron Islands. In 1885, he went to the US with his brother. He attended Boston College and then uh, Livermore College in California. Um, he graduated from Eastman College in New York with an MA in accountancy and then he set up a practice in Mexico. Now that's what's on Wikipedia. What he also did is he set up a vineyard in Mexico because he realized with prohibition that a lot of places have gone bust in, in America and he took knowledge that he gained in California down to Mexico and he saw a little gap in the market, the church. Church needed wine for mass, and he ended up setting up a vineyard and doing very well for himself, uh, supplying the church in Mexico. Clever boy, and that's him in Mexican dress there, which is a fantastic uh, postcard, postcard image. Um, returning to Ireland in 1898 on holiday, he became involved in Congrega, uh, so much so that he remained in the country as one of its organizers. And he ended up going on that trip in 1905 with Douglas Hyde to fundraise. They collected about twenty thousand dollars, which is huge money at the time. They returned it a year later for relief for the San Francisco earthquake. Yeah, so they did this big massive fundraising, and then when the earthquake hit, they realised actually, you know what, this money was badly needed where it was collected, so it was given back. So there you go. Wow. A few more little snippets uh, that are of, of, our, of American significance. On the left, we have a legal agreement between the Gaelic League. Um, in Ireland and in California. Next, we have a letter dated 1924 from the solicitor of Boston, which gives background information on a check which was given to Delaware in 1919 for thousands of dollars. It was raised by a Boston sewing club um, that had become part of the Gaelic School Society of, of Boston. <clears throat> and it's, it's interesting because the, the, it describes how the check was given to Dev and then Dev couldn't accept the check um, it needed to be uh, turned into a bond and Harry Boland went back with a letter of thanks to them and explained that a bond would be coming and asked them who they would be donating the money to and they basically said either the Gaelic League or uh, St. Endless which was Robert Pierce's school. Next we have what was probably, this was the Irish anthem before our current Irish anthem and uh, Soldiers of Air, but this particular uh, publication was published in New York to raise, to raise funds and it's signed by Captain Monteith. He ended up buying it in New York and sending it back to Ireland. And then we have another ancient order of Hibernians in America, more, more fundraising there. And I think it's one of the important factors of all of this, if we're talking about transformative figures, with Colin Vega, so much of that work was done at grassroots level. So it's not so much the big names as the individuals, but the organization as a whole was transformative because of that, of that work. Again. Yeah, please. Now, Cormac is laughing. I wonder yeah. why. <laughs> there is one of these that is not like the others. And um, so we have uh, quite a few uh, music uh, interests, particularly piping interests, especially for you, Jim. Yeah. Um, <laughs> so uh, the first top left is the Finton Lawler Pipe Band getting ready to play on Match Day in Croke Park. Uh, so that's the national stadium for the GAA. We don't have a date. Um, on the photograph and beneath it here, we have, that's from the 1940s, and we've identified the people in the photograph as Andy Keane, Josephine O'Dowd, who was sister-in-law to the guy beside her, Willie Reynolds, Dick O'Neill, and Francis Peak. Uh, we have in the middle of 13th Fesh Irish Youth Day in Filsmith Park in 1956, and I can't remember what Filsmith Park is. I did look it up and have forgotten. Um, you also have on the top um, left is uh, the London branch of Conan Vega visiting Clarny for the 1914 Arachis, and that's the pipe band of them. The only one, the odd man out, and the bottom left is taken on Law and Vega. So 
Irish Language Day, um, where there was music and dance in the streets of Dublin. And there you'll see Cormac's brother and sister, Colin and Dara, along with Duran Dye, all ex river dancers. There are the dance river dancers. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. So all ex river dancers. So that's the question. Okay, you know. Sorry, I need to start flying through these. <laughs> Oh, yeah, because <laughs> yeah, you're not in many of the other photographs. <laughs> I looked. I, I, I. Okay. Next okay, slide, next one, yep. Ben away. Yeah. Okay, so some beautiful Christmas cards, but very specifically aimed at, I, at Irish people. At, sorry, Conrad Grady is sending them to people in America. Um, so they all basically say, not a guap. So, um, happy Christmas to you from Conor Gaeilge in Ireland. Um, and these were possibly uh, sold by the branches, um, so that you know Conor Gaeilge branches will be sending, uh, and, and individual members will be sending greetings. But they're all quite beautiful, I, I, I think, all by the same artist. All righty. Again. Yep. Time to move on to Mary Robinson. Um, firstly, as I flagged earlier, I'm so close to this, but as you can see, there are quite a lot of categories already jumping out. Um, she, most, most of us would remember her as Ireland's first female president and how she reshaped that role of the president. The archive also contains a lot of material from that period. It includes events such as presidential election campaign, state visits, correspondence with members of the public, including school children, and as well as correspondence with international VIPs. Um, but there is much more to it than that. The material covers a period of up to six decades of her work as a barrister, senator, legislator, and lecturer. And human rights and civil rights were and still are a common theme throughout her work. So here are the main categories in the arrangement, as you can see. And I'm going to briefly, very briefly, I'll do my best to be fast, uh, skim through these. So if you want to go to the next slide. So pre-presidency. Before she was president, she was barrister, an academic, professor, legislator, and senator. Law and morality was the title of her maiden speech in 1967, and much of what she discussed there became almost like a map um, of her work for the following decades. Looking at the list of cases she was involved in, it's like looking at one precedent setting case after another. Family planning, support for single mothers, adoption laws, pensions for widowers after their partner died, you could, uh, miscarriage of justice and community campaigns such as the Woodkey campaign in the late 1970s. So in Dublin in the 70s, Dublin City Council themselves were building civic offices on top of what was discovered to be a Viking settlement. And this campaign was to block that. They didn't succeed. What they did succeed in doing was to get the material underneath the site before it was built to get it logged and, and retrieved, but also the laws changed afterwards. It was a huge uh, campaign. So that's the Save Our National Monument. Then, of course, there was the presidency itself. And her, it was unquestionably groundbreaking. And part of the reason for that is she knew the law. So she knew what could and couldn't be done. Um, a lot of what had happened with that role was status quo and the government trying to control the president by saying, well, you know, it's just a, you know, it's a, a head, a head figure of what actually we have the power and this is what we do. And Mary Robinson as a lawyer turned around and said, well, actually, no, we have, the president has more roles than you're, than you're allowing. Uh, and she was incredibly important for that. But she also had a few themes to her presidency. Diaspora was definitely one. She wanted to reach out to the diaspora. And she was the person who came up with the idea of having a light in the window of the Oris, which is the, uh, the, our equivalent of a vitus, um, a light shining for the diaspora, which was a hugely symbolic and um, powerful symbol of her presidency. Inviting communities, especially marginalized communities, to the Oris was another one. On the top um, left, we have a, a, a poster. So, um, commemorating the visit of the lesbian and gay community to the Oris. Um, Rwanda was another one. She was the first head of state to visit during the famine. And I think a lot of people will remember the speech she made where she got quite emotional. And Mary Robinson was this figure and still is this figure that a lot of people always accused her of having no emotion because she was very matter of fact about what she did. And I think when she, when she 
her voice broke at, at that time when she was making that speech, crying out to heads of state all over the world to help. It really affected quite a lot of people and it was a powerful moment. And she called her privilege out and she used her privilege um, to get that message across. Uh, the middle one is um, her visiting Inishman and standing beside um, Singh's chair. So um, arts and culture was a huge part of her remit as well. And she quoted Heaney regularly, but there's also lovely letters from James to her. They were good friends. And some beautiful letters of James uh, thanking her for quoting him. And um, very, very uh, poignant. One of my, fam my favourite images is in the next slide. So this is her inauguration. The one on the left is what she officially signs um, when she was being inaugurated as president. But it's the one on the right that really gets me. This is her practicing her signature <laughs> with the quill. And it was the quill that de Valera used when he signed his inauguration papers. And can you imagine, like I looked at that and I went, hey, okay, it's, it's kind of funny that she's practicing her signature. But also it's this idea, what must she, she have been thinking about? moment in time. I mean, she was incredibly young as well. She was in her late 40s, which is young for that role. Uh, and there she was, the first woman. And um, one of the first in the world um, as well. Not This isn't just an Irish context. One of the first in the world. And there she is, practicing her signature with me. I just thought it was beautiful. Okay, mm. Of course, she wasn't just president. She went on to become a High Commissioner for Human Rights for the United Nations. Um, she was in that role from 98 to 2002, and she pushed for that office to be less passive uh, than it had been. She, she was trying to get that. She was constantly pushing the boundaries and constantly trying to get people to, to, to take more risks and be more proactive. She went on to become um, Special Envoy for the Great Lakes region of Africa, Special Envoy for Climate Change, and Special Envoy for El Nino. And she was also part of the Civil Society Advisory Group to the United Nations on Women, Peace and Security. And on the left here, we have a letter of congratulations to her from the Dalai Lama. And on the right, a letter of congratulations from Senator Ted Kennedy, when it was announced that she got the role as High Commissioner. Okay. Now, much of what I'm showing you, I'm showing you because uh, I can't show you much because we start getting into GDPR territory and the 20 year rule, the 30 year rule. But here um, are, are some more of the organizations. When she left her role as High Commissioner, she set up an organization called uh, Realizing Rights, the Ethical Globalization Initiative. And that was linked with Columbia University and the International Council of Human Rights. Um, and that was really about corporate responsibility. Uh, and I'm, I'm really racing through this. The middle is elders. She also became uh, one of the elders um, that was set up by uh, Nelson Mandela in 2007. So the material in the archive that includes correspondence with Mandela and with Archbishop, Archbishop Tutu here. Um, and she became chair of elders. Um, she's still chair of elders. And then on the right, um, it's interesting, one of the things I came across was research she did herself on foundations. How long is a foundation uh, if effective? And it was 10 years. If you go beyond 10 years, your message isn't, getting, isn't going to get out. And she seems to have kept to this because uh, she finished uh, Realising Rights in 2010 and within weeks, and there is an overlap. She had set up this new foundation, um, Mary Robinson Foundation Climate Justice, which ran until 2019. And again, that's all about how climate change disproportionately affects um, those with less power. And that is a simplification of, of that work, but there's huge, huge work to be seen there. All right, let's get on. Again, one of my favorite aspects of this, children sending in letters and sending in drawings. And it's not just that they're really sweet um, and it's a, it's a, you know, a snapshot in time, if you turn around to those as adults now, for them to find out where letter was kept is hugely important. But also if you turn around and show children now that other children's documents were kept by somebody as, as important as Mary Robinson, it means they feel they have a voice and that their voice, their child's voice is important. And that's hugely transformative for them uh, going forward. That's why I included them. Are we good? Yep.
lots more in the archive covers all of the various organizations she was patron of, honorary president of, chair of, advisor of. It's 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 actually um it's it's kind of ridiculous just how, how busy she was and, and continues to be. Okay. We're we're racing through now. Mm. This one is a good one. Another section is on the awards she got. So honorary degrees, but also you know, direct awards, and this one is present um president presidential medal of freedom. And I'm going to just read out uh, what it says, because I think that itself is, is hugely significant. Um, for Mary Robinson, the fight to end discrimination and suffering is an urgent moral imperative. She has been a trailblazing crusader for women's rights in Ireland and a forceful advocate for equality and human rights around the world. Whether courageously visiting conflict-stricken regions or working to reject concern for human rights into business and economic development, Mary Robinson continues this important work today urging citizens and nations to make common cause for justice. That's 2009. She hadn't even set up her Mary Robinson Foundation Climate Justice. There was still more to come, and there is still more to come. She hasn't stopped. So that particular uh, award is, is very well phrased. So that's that guy. We have, um, we have a local-ish one here. So this is something from the Midwest. Fourth Annual Midwest Light Human Rights Awards lunch in Chicago 2003. So lots of events, programs for events, and keynote speeches that she makes are in here. This particular one was benefiting the Midwest Immigrant and Human Rights Center and the Marjorie Culver Center for the Treatment of Survivors of Torture. Uh, the keynote speaker was Mary Robinson, and a quote serves saying, Human rights must be at the center of the international agenda if the world is to achieve peace and justice. I just thought I'd conclude that very briefly. Yeah. You're all very uh, aware of the lands that we are currently on at present, and we really, we must uh, honour and recognise um, the Indigenous people. Um, here, while it's not the Native American tribes of this area, I thought it was important to show as well, there is a huge... Um, growing connection between Ireland and not just the, the Choctaw Nation, but other indigenous tribes. There, there is a growing awareness in Ireland. And it's a, a very a very unique story, I think. Um, it goes back to when, in 1847, shortly after the suffering uh, and toll of the Trail of Tears, um, you know, what that did to the Choctaw tribe, they heard about the misery of the Irish people and the Irish family, and they still managed to collect and donate $170 in aid when they had barely enough themselves, and that's the equivalent of about $5,000 today. In 1992, more than 20 Irish people walked the Trail of Tears, raising relief funds for a famine in Somalia. A few years later, Gary White Deer led an annual famine walk in Ireland, and on the left, we see a letter from Gary to Mary, and on the left and on the right, a search proclaiming her honorary chief. Go on. And just I'm going off script very briefly. I'm not sure if everybody has seen this. In case you aren't aware of it, in 2017 in Middleton's Bailey Park in Ireland, uh, a tribute was erected to the tribe's charity during the Great Famine, and it's named Kindred Spirits. Mm -hmm. And it features nine giant stainless steel feathers, each slightly different uh, shaped in, into an empty bowl. The Choctaw Ireland Scholarship Programme was announced subsequently um, in 2018, where the Irish government um, paid for Choctaw, Choctaw scholars to have full tuition and more than $10,000 in living expenses for a graduate degree in University College Cork. In 2020, during the COVID pandemic, a crowdfund was set up to help raise vital funds for the Navajo and Hopi tribes who were so disproportionately affected by the pandemic. News traveled across the water. Suddenly, they started seeing all of these donations, $18.47, $184.70, in some cases, $1,847. In other cases, it was $170 or $17 or fractions of this. It was Irish people donating in honor of a different tribe, but in honor of 
the Chop Dolls uh, generosity 173 years earlier. And in total, 20,000 donations came in from Ireland over the course of about three or four days, totaling $670,000. Uh, Chief Gary Batten of the Chop Donation said uh, that adversity can bring out the best of people and said he was happy to see his ancestors' generosity inspiring donations to other Native American tribes. We are gratified and perhaps not at all surprised to learn that the assistance of our special friends, the Irish, are given to the Navajo and Hopi nations. Our word for their selfless act is Iyikawa, I hope I'm pronouncing that right. It means serving those in need. We have become kindred spirits with the Irish in the years since the Irish invasion famine, and we hope the Irish, Navajo, and Hopi peoples develop lasting friendships as we have. Sharing our cultures makes the world go smaller. I just think it's a little side, little side line um, from the archives, but relevant all the same. Yeah. We were involved in a project called Kindred Spirits, which dealt with this whole wow. um, part. So it's information is available on the website. I'll just look at the, see if we could direct people to it. Very good. Well. So, so it, it, it's hugely significant. And I think that relationship is just so obvious because when you're looking at all this correspondence in the archive. Um, why is the work of archivists important? Well, first of all, archives belong to all of us. They're not just for historians. They're telling all of our stories. And it's really important to get the message out that these archives are available for all of us to access. Unless for a very specific reason they're closed. They could be closed because they're private. They could be closed because they're corporate. Um, so corporate assets would be in archives. And they might be closed temporarily because of legislation. But otherwise, they're open to all. And it's important to get across as well that there are lots of different types of archives. It isn't just historic. You can have, you know, as I said, corporate archives, like Guinness has an archive, for example. Um, I'm sure Walgreens has an archive, Walmart certainly mm -hmm. would. All of these brands, they all have archives. Um, you have government archives, which a lot can be in the national archives of the country. You have music archives, film archives, architectural archives. Every single aspect of human, human life generates constantly, generates records. Those records today are the archives of tomorrow. So when we think of archives, it's somebody generating a record that shows something happened, or some transaction happened, or some interaction happened. That's what archives are. And our work is important for another reason, fake news. <laughs> no matter how often history is revised or rewritten, the narrative can be refuted if the original documents are preserved in an archive together with the context in which they were created. In other words, if somebody goes off and doctors an item or takes a, a, an item out of context and pretends it was generated for something else, if that item, the original, is in an archive, that can be used to, just to, to uh, contradict and to correct, to correct the, the, the narrative. And it's usually important. And it's important to get across as well, again, this isn't just paper, this is digital. Archivists are at the cutting edge um, in terms of technology. Um, a lot of what digital archivists do is, along with archivists of, of hybrid collections, is proving the authenticity of an item and, and showing the context. That, that includes things like showing if an image or a recording has been doctored or if it's the original. Um, and again, hugely important. As it happens, a very large part of our role is to appraise authenticity. Did you know, for example, that archivists are employed on a regular basis in The Hague to help in the prosecution of war crimes? Um, the records they contain are so important to these archives that often they become strategic military targets. So in the Ukraine, for example, one of the first targets was buildings that had archives that related to Russia, that Russians couldn't access at the time, but the information <coughs> was open in the Ukraine. And so one of the targets was the archive, the archives in, in, in the Ukraine. And you'll always get that as well. If you are trying to cleanse, for want of a horrible better word, um, a group of, of, of people, an ethnicity, how do you do it? You destroy the records. They no longer officially exist. They can't prove their name. They can't prove what they own, where they lived, what work they had. They can't drive. They can't. They can't travel to another country. If you remove their records, 
essentially they don't exist. And part of that removal is cultural identity, which is why um, you know we might think culture is a kind of a, a, a light part of the picture, but that soft politics is hugely important, and um, culture is hugely important in the identity of, of a person. And so if you were turning around to oppressing a language, for example, if you're oppressing a way of performing or clothes that are being worn, that's all part of the moving in identity and cleansing. And archives are the, 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 the counter to that. And that's really why these archives are very important. So I think we've gone way over time. So <laughs> I'm going to stop there. Yeah, there's, there's two more. So this one is if you wanted to follow archives online. Um, there are various accounts. And Ara Ireland is the Archives and Records Association of Ireland, and I'm their communications manager. And every November there is the Explore Your Archive campaign. And if you follow on Twitter, you'll see there'll be various themes on, on, on every day, and people will share stuff in their archives and that themes, and it can be fun. So it's a very, very accessible way of, of uh, accessing archives. So that's it. Can do Fantastic. Okay, so sorry about that. There's a lot crammed into it. No, but that's great. And we got it up and working privately eventually. Thank goodness. Are that's we fun. live? Or is we I are, yeah, yeah, yeah. I just have a couple of questions. Yeah, please, yes. Yeah, let's, um, let's chat. One of the things, um, I had a couple of things, both from an archivist point of view and another from a researcher point of view. When you said you have a digital archives, does that include documentation of what is um, posted on live, uh, online as text as well as images? I'm thinking back, um, I had a former lifetime as um, researcher of Afghan materials and the Taliban for a long time had a website. And then, oh, miraculously in 1998 when there was a lot of negativity, you know, um, toward them. They took down their website, but I had, um, you know, printed off pages and pages and pages just for my own interest. But I'm thinking about um, other materials, you know, related yeah, to Robinson or whatever. Do especially you, with her, I was going to ask the same thing. Yeah. Especially with her era. Yeah, um, it's it's hugely important, and a lot of it was. I mean, what's really sweet in the Mary Robinson archive. I'm going to answer this kind of. Twofold, if you don't mind. Um, there are, there's emails between her and her daughter, and her daughter is explaining to her how to kick him on attachment. And, <laughs> and, and you know, and there's there, there's a speech where she's launching the web. Um, you know, so interestingly, while the newer material, a lot of it is more digital, the initial stuff was all paper. Um, yeah. And what's great for, for us is the fact she printed out a lot of her emails, which means I was we're just not trying to access. Yeah, mm -hmm. it's, it's hugely problematic. Um, in terms of websites, to answer that the first, yeah. and just in terms generally, some of the things um, that, are, that, that are part of the archive work would be web archiving. But it's a, it's a blunt tool, it's essentially yeah. taking screen grabs. I know. Um, so, it like, needs to improve, but it's an area we looked at. But again, it is the sheer volume. Um, for example, the Library of Congress for a long time had promised to um, retain every single tweet, not knowing at the time how huge Twitter would become. And maybe two years ago or three years ago, uh, it was during the Trump presidency anyway, they announced, we, we can't, we can't do it. Yes. We, we, do, we do not have the resources to do this. And archivists all over the world went, ah! but it's like it's ironic because now people are doing it themselves. People are taking screen grabs mm -hmm. before things disappear. So there's a kind of a, a knowledge that that people are getting very quickly. Okay, this might disappear, but I'm going to I'm going to save it in, in some form. So things like what you did there are hugely important. Yeah. And some of what people will do in, in the archive world is they would they would crowdsource. So you would have messages going out, did anybody happen to print out that way before it went mm -hmm. down, you know? Um, I know, for example, the National Library in Ireland regularly do a trawl of websites, but they can't do them all. And all they're doing is screen grabs. And those screen grabs, so for links, for example, the links won't work. It's literally just a photograph. But it's so that there was at least some record Something. of what was there. Yeah. And especially that early era, like, I mean, mm -hmm. Did that, you did that in the late 90s. That's yeah. really well, because that's the like, it was like 1994. 
was in 1994 or later, a little bit in between 1994 and 1998. But, the, and, but a lot of people talk about that, like kind of that from then to like 2003 or whatever. It's kind of like a black hole because yeah. people didn't realize that it was worth saving at the time. Yeah. Yeah. Well, and I was just doing it as a night. Oh gosh, maybe I should just, you know, I'm always printing off pages of things, yeah. you know, yeah. so that I can integrate some info. But um, yeah. I think we all have a way of keeping stuff. If if we're aware that it needs to be kept, it's getting that message out that sometimes it needs to be kept. But also, we can't be <coughs> completely bogged down either. I mean, artists will always turn around and, and point out, for example. Plenty of conversations have happened on golf courses that there are no records for. Mm -hmm. You know, there are always for every method of, of, of retaining information, there are loopholes to make sure that the information is retained. I had one other question. Um, I'm interested, I mean, always text is important, but visual documentation. And so how do you, I mean, there's ad nauseum materials that you have that mm -hmm. are visual. And so as an outside researcher, if one was to have access to any archival material, um, do you consult with the archivist first about what search words are going to be the most meaningful to search their data or that database? Mm -hmm. Or do you just use the ones that are most familiar to you in your academic or whatever background? I think, first of all, it depends on what it is you're looking for, but archivists don't go to the trouble of all of this work just for the archive to sit there. Yeah. We openly encourage people to contact us. It's what we want is for people to understand why there might be limitations on what can be found or what can be shown, but we, act, we actively encourage people to contact us so that we can guide, because the person that knows the collection the best is the archivist who catalogue it. So that archivist would be able to give you examples, for example, and, and say, you know, the search words you're, you're using will bring up all of this information, but actually, I think what you really need is this over here, mm -hmm. and they will guide you. And that's, it's, you know, archivists are your, are your friends, get, get to know them and, and have, you know, reach out because that is a huge part of our profession as well. One of the things that is linked to our profession is, is the money factor, unfortunately. You know, it costs money for this work to be done, it costs money for it to be stored. And if you work for an organization, you need to find a way of justifying that work, uh, quantifying it and justifying it. And part of justifying it is showing that people are interested in it and they're accessing it. And so if you're getting this feedback, if you're getting these, in these inquiries coming in, you're able to show, look, this collection is generating a lot of interest. This one over here, no one's interested in it. A real specific um, topic that I couldn't help but um, wonder about is, especially in the country of Nguelga, is the use of the language and the change of the um, language over time and expressions that you can find just, I mean, I have a modest background in, yeah. in the Irish, but it was fun to see you know, some of the colloquial maybe expressions. And Again, that comes into our profession. Our professional training would involve, um, you know, the cataloging, the language we use in cataloging is very specific. Archival standards require us to be as concise as possible um, and to be as clear and unambiguous as possible. Um, but you will have issues, for example, changing spelling in the Irish language. And so to be consistent across the cataloging cataloging of our collection like on the Vega, I would state at the start, modern spelling will be used, where appropriate original spelling will be given in brackets. So mm -hmm. you know, square brackets, for example, from the Vega itself changed, um, changed its spelling and changed, and changed um, quite a lot of things. I mean, for those that might be aware of it, uh, the Irish language spelling wasn't standardized until the 1950s. Yeah. So lots of different ways of spelling, but also there were a lot of people who weren't, um, Literate in Irish, or there were different dialects where they were just doing slightly differently. And this standardization helped an awful lot, but, but it was an issue. But then there's the other part of your question in some cases, language might be appropriate. Um, the way medical, um, medical reports were written in the 19th century, if you looked at those terminologies now, I mean, it's triggering, it's insulting, it's racist a lot of the time. It's, you know, all the ists are in there. And yet, as an archivist, you have to keep the original record. So what you would do is you would put almost like a trigger warning. 
you know, archivist's note, the language here will be, you know, is not appropriate. It is kept originally, but it is not appropriate or whatever way you would phrase it. And that's how you'd have to do it because you can't change the archival record either. Otherwise, everybody would be rewriting history. And we go back to that whole thing that, that one of the core roles of an archivist is to show the, the authenticity of a document. That this is the original, this is undoctored, this is what is, or if it is doctored, this is the context in which it was doctored. So let me tell you kind of an anecdote from my days at the newspaper. I was go to store and it had a pretty bad error in it. This was when they were first putting stories in the electronic library. So of course, I had to write one of my many corrections. The correction never got put in the library. So then later, another reporter who replaced me was doing a roundup of stories and got decided that my original story was worth mentioning. She had no access to the correction. So when her piece came out, the error was repeated again. Yeah. Is that a hazard that, that you it, face? It, it, it is. I mean, it's again, it's one of these things. The the utopian <clears throat> situation would be that everything's cataloged. Yeah. And what will help avoid that is more cataloging happening and more archives being hired and the importance of archives being understood. Uh, the gaps that are there that cause things like these errors being perpetuated is because. The archiving job hasn't been done, you know. And but you have it in the Costine example, you know, where people didn't realize he composed tunes and then they recorded them and they listed them as trash, and then other people heard their albums and re recorded them. I mean, the chief just recorded one of the titles as a Kerry Fling, and you're going, everyone's going to listen to this album, and it happened. Other people recorded the same album, got their information again because they didn't have access to Cousins Archive, there isn't really one. And they took the sleep notes as, as gospel, and the error was perpetuated. It's impossible to avoid it everywhere. But what I would say is the more you can have archivists cataloging, the more uh, attention and care that's given to an archivist, the less that you have. Strikes me that would be just incredibly prevalent in the whole world of traditional music because two names are constantly changing and mm -hmm. morphing and trying to come up with a definitive original would be almost impossible. It, 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 it's one of these things, it's funny, the talk I'm giving in, in, in Dallas is all about, you know, the stories behind two names and two naming conventions and everything. And a huge part of our tradition is that oral tradition of hand and eye. And, you know, from that point of view, you're absolutely right. But where somebody has composed a tune and they've written it down, but they've composed it, getting that out there and archived and cataloged properly is what stops that happening. I think in, in the Irish traditional music scene, um, you know, separate from what we're talking here in terms of politics or from the greater, um, the challenge and the obstacle is this tradition of passing on, but also um, for quite a long time, people were unaware of the importance of the name of the tune. Why does it matter who wrote it? That's changed, that's changing, that's changed. And one of the reasons it's changed is because it's monetized. There are people now that depend on royalties, <coughs> particularly during the pandem pandemic, mm -hmm. people who couldn't perform anymore were absolutely relying on royalties and CD sales. And if their tunes weren't being properly credited, they weren't getting the royalties. So that's, what's, that's part of what's changed. And sometimes money can be a dirty word, but I think in terms of actually knowing who's created something, regardless of whether there's money attached to it or not, I think that's, that's hugely important. Yeah, it's very complex with the Irish mm -hmm. music because there's different value systems yeah. within it too. I mean, yeah. a lot of people want, you know, want their things just to be played. You know. mm -hmm. Varies a lot. Yeah. The um, well, I, I was just I thought it was nice that you talked a little bit about um, what I think you mentioned the Iraq this uh, part of the archive being like a popular thing because people are looking for their relatives' names. So I just, I don't know, I don't know if it's really a question, but just to say that I, I'm thinking as you're speaking about uh, who you have in mind as you're doing the archival work and as you're choosing the arrangement, like, because part of it is thinking about the user, right? The people that would come in and what would be maybe a popular item or, or maybe like a most useful way to arrange. Yeah. But you're also thinking about the person that you're archiving, right? And you're thinking about rights. And, and you're also about... thinking long term because what's fashionable now might be fashionable for sure. in 10 years' time. And so, what you're trying to do is not block off any avenue for any good. Right. So, you're trying to. But that gets to be so much work. 
Yeah. Do. Yeah. It's just so massive. And then, and, and things have a, things I think have value in different ways because there are certain items like the Rockus lists and the names maybe where it really is the, the, the thoroughness of it that's going to make it value, valuable. Like having all of it would yeah. really be what's most valuable. There's maybe another item where you just need like an exemplary yeah. you know, thing to, yeah. to, to illustrate that X even existed or happened. You know? it's, so. it's very interesting because the archive profession has changed hugely. Originally, the archive profession was all about servicing historians and their research. Mm -hmm. In fact, you know, one of the so you would always be thinking about academic historians exactly. to do the job at all. This was and yeah. this was the early days of the profession, and there was an archival theorist whose name has gone for me now. Well, his whole thing was that archivists were the handmaidens for the historians, which obviously goes down like a lead balloon you know, <laughs> in classes now. Archive theory is to be changed. Now it's about yes. It's important that you know historians and, and researchers have access to this but actually our job is to make sure it's preserved for whoever may need to access it because social justice is a huge part of this now mm -hmm. uh, human rights is a huge part of this i mentioned the hate for example war crimes um <laughs> telling the story of a pandemic who was disproportionately affected getting all of that material in was one of the things not top of, of, of anybody's you know list of priorities in the middle of of a pandemic, but every now and then there was a shout out going, keep any, you know, ephemera that you might come across. If you see, you know, a flyer coming in or somebody's put, yeah. you know, something up on a pillar, you know, we, we want some record of it. And it's endless, it's an endless task. Trying to preserve everything is an endless task. Trying to make sure that whatever medium it's in will be accessible in 10 years' time. That's an endless task. Um, Trying to catalog it all is an endless task. And our have to be, I mean, our middle name is, is, is pragmatism. Well, that's the thing. I mean, you, um, yeah. yeah. You're limited. Right, right. And if you think about it, like look at everything that's already been lost all across you know, centuries. Um, I don't think it's feasible to try and keep everything. And maybe sometimes some of what was missing is, is part of the story in itself. And that's kind of yeah. how you have to look at it. Yeah, that's the hardest part for me is that, you know, when I interned at the Minnesota State Archives, we went into like a cavern beneath the Port Authority of St. Paul. <laughs> and the, and the, the, the guy that I was interned with just was like, hey, we'll take this box and this box. And it's like, oh. <laughs> there's like, there's like 50 other boxes. Yeah, but, you know, he was like professional enough to make that call. And you have to, for and example, you, when I was archiving, uh, when I was cataloging the public Vega archive, and the same thing would happen with Mary Robinson. I could spend a year cataloging one box down to every single page. Yeah, or so you have to decide. I to could it. make sure the entire collection was made safe. And so I've got to choose the one where I'm making sure everything is safe first. And then, you know, catalog layer by layer by layer, and then you run out of time and move on. And you also have to go, well, the researchers will find stuff. I mean, would that be great? The other thing that I find fascinating is, uh, I mean, it's not the end of life over here. <laughs> but um, you think about your own personal archive, so to speak, and the materials you save and you don't save, and what you pass on, and, and how do you organize that? I mean, it's not quite the same as an archivist, but, oh, but, it's all it, but it is. I mean, we're living in the age of I do my own research, right? Yeah, yeah. So, like, I'm just thinking here, like we were saying last night, like, there's like, oh, because it's that that wasn't archival because it was my tape that I had. Yeah. But all the lines these days, at least for the public, I think because yeah. of Google, yeah. because of like what the internet, that, yeah. like, we all think that we're our both archivists and researchers, both. And, it's, and it's one of these right. things where those lines become very blurred. In some cases, that's a really good thing. And in some cases, it's not because everyone's using ownership of everything. And then you suddenly lose control. And archivists, we're not control freaks. And we're not, we don't see ourselves as gatekeepers. That, that we don't see but it comes across that way. The people that are used to Google and, and feeling like oh, every yeah. image is free. And the Donald Trump's and, example. Oh my God, the archivist there. Oh, well, they're probably gone. Yeah. Well, I mean, and, you know, trying very desperately not to mention politics, but I appreciate the archivist that has to go through the papers that were hidden in certain toilets. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, it, 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 it's, it's hugely, it's hugely difficult to, 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 to read this. And yet sometimes you have to, because control of the archive 
from the point of view of intellectual control is important. Not in terms of accessing, access isn't the issue, but it's making sure that you can protect the record for the future. You, you, you always have to be thinking from that point of view. And so if, if access to a particular part of the archive now will jeopardize access for a lot more people in the future, you have to protect it. And that's part of it. So you're constantly juggling big picture versus the current. And one of the things as well with Google is that, is that it has created this monster that everything, everybody wants everything instantly. Yeah. And trying part of our job now is to explain a part of what I was doing there. I didn't just want to show what, what we're into our face. I wanted to show what was on first before it be made available and why that's important. Because it's not instant work. It's years of work. Um, and it's, I mean, Brian knows that only too well. well and, yeah. Brian, yeah, you know, somebody digitized, the word digitized gets banded about very, very easily. And at the time we hear about a collection being donated to the University of Galway and it can be digitized, we're like, please don't say that straight away because now they expect it to be available it's straight 20 away. 20 years of work. And it has digitized at all, it costs millions, you know. And, and nor should it all be digitized either, you know. You want, sometimes you want people to make those their digital discoveries. And, and also, sometimes the stuff isn't actually that important. Well, the, power, <laughs> you know? the power of it is being selective and yeah. figuring out what is important, what isn't. You know, and otherwise, the, everything's important and exactly, then nothing's important. Exactly. And that's why one of the first roles that we have as an archivist is to appraise. Appraise the collection is the very first thing. Exactly. But does the archivist have any responsibility for how the researcher interprets the data? Are you just a no. uh, kind of rule where you come back and say, well, that's not what it says, well, that's what it says to me? Or well, is your role is just to say, here's the data you do with the first deal? No, but what you will find is archivists seeing somebody has taken a particular item a particular way, and suddenly archivists will be leaving breadcrumbs for other people to go mm -hmm. find the same item. <laughs> <laughs> you know, but look, this is actually what the item says. Mm -hmm. If you take it by itself, you know, I mean, it's like, you know, it, it's you trust, you have to trust the people when they come in and access something that they're going to feed your researchers or that they have the best of intentions, but you can't control that. And you and you know, I mean, people will accidentally make mistakes. And it's not, if we were spending all our time correcting everyone else's use of the items, we wouldn't get anything else out of life. So, no, it's a separation. We're behind the scenes. We, we this is the line where we've made it available up to everybody else. But there would be times where we would flag that something has been taken out of context, or we would let colleagues know, in other words, in other information professions, know, look, we've seen that this particular document that's in our, in our archive has been taken to mean this, but actually this is the full context. And at the start, when, when we say cataloging, at the very start of cataloging an archive, there would be a whole section that would show the history of the collection how the material in that collection got to be created in the first place and how it got to be deposited into the university or whatever location. Because that, that uh, study of history and the history of the archive itself is hugely important. That's the context. And that's where archivists would flag, look, there are gaps in this collection or, for example, South African government archives during the apartheid. The archivist will, and that's uh, um, Fern, Fern Harris, he's, he's kind of, one of the idols for archivists is very nerdy, this is how we work. Mm -hmm. But he was very instrumental in getting that message across that um, archivists would flag gaps in a collection and, 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 and in some cases actively go out to try and fill those gaps. Again, I was talking about the handmaidens in early archival period, mm -hmm. very passive. Now archivists are activists, and so we go out and actively get material from marginalized groups to make sure their voices are being heard properly. Um, but it's, again, another endless task. We do the best with what we have. Uh, um, I remember hearing the phrase parsimonious uh, preservation, and it's basically you're doing the best you can um, in the short time you have, and then you're handing over the relay stick to the next person. And you can't think, if you think in terms of, I have to preserve everything forever, you're paralyzed. Whereas I have to preserve as much as I can for the next person. And it's their responsibility to, to preserve that bit for the for the generation again. Yeah. Whatever, that's all we can do. But basically, yeah. Um, 
the more our profession is is known about and the, the more the the terms don't get used liberally where there's a real understanding from the work of the artist the better I think it's, it's endless time yeah. yeah thanks Steve uh, right. Yeah. 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 Yeah.